Well, I'm incredibly happy to welcome you, uh, Bijoy, and to welcome Bijoy Jain uh, to deliver the 2024 John Forrester 64 Fan Lecture at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. We're really honored to have you here and to have you here coming from Mumbai. Uh, and I would like everyone to, to, to so with our appreciation. Okay. And the, the Joy Forrester uh, uh, lecture is very important for us. Uh, it's this annual moment that we meet here to celebrate the work of a very singular and, and successful architect that has done amazing uh, contributions to the world we live in. John Forrester graduated from GSAP in 1964, and one of his enduring memories was how the school allowed him to engage with those who were shaping the future of architecture around the world. GSAP is founded as a node that gives a home to those with the ambition and the energy to contribute to make the world more intelligent, more fair. And we're very honored that the family of John Forrester is here with us tonight. And on behalf of GSAP, I extend my gratitude to Claire, Claire Forrester and to Dan Bernstein, who are here with us here. And thank you so much for, for making this possible and for your continued support uh, that enables this special program to, to be possible. In 1995, Bijoy Jain founded the office Bijoy Jain and Associates after graduating from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri and working in LA and London for a while. In 2005, he renamed its studio, Studio Mumbai, and its head office in Alibag, a coastal, and placed its head office in Alibag, a coastal city in the Raja district of Maharashtra, Maharashtra, India. At this point, Studio Mumbai was not only the, the name of a firm, it rapidly struck the world as a physical laboratory or a kind of a node of exchange in, in the way that you were explaining it right now, uh, that actually was making possible that you could work uh, in close proximity to artisans, to stone, stone masons, to uh, carpenters, to bricks moving around the city, uh, bicycles, uh, and international photographers and filmmakers were actually expanding that and making that something that the whole world would, will, will see and would be surprised and amazed by. In 2010, actually, uh, this uh, kind of a sample or sort of the a glimpse to this node of distributed office touched Venice in the Venice Biennial, where your installation workplace intervened the collective notion of what architecture can be. But much closer in India, as a result of this office, these uh, exchanges, this, this care that you place in, in making things happen, uh, there were things happening like these one-to-one -one models. They, they were made of paper, right? These paper uh, models that you were setting in space as a, uh, as a way to actually think and expand your thinking and your sensitivity and share it with others, making it something that others could also be part of. And, and I love the way that you explain now that your work is very much about immersion, about being part of things, and how these models have evolved now into, into the possibility of identifying what surrounds you and mobilizing it as part of your, your, your thinking and your experience. Uh, and, but it's also important that these models were making your, your work, your drawings, travel to wind and to other means and to other energies that now are part of your very, very intensively part of your work. In an interview to Pinup Magazine in, 2012, uh, in 2020, you said, my interest lies primarily in doing what I do with care. As an architect, the way you imagine opening a door, developing a chair, designing the texture of a wall or a floor is very important. It's about quality, about the consideration you apply to the making of something. And it's about being at uh, attentive to the environment, the materials, the inhabitants. It has to be inclusive. And I think that this inclusiveness is not only a desire in your work, not a political claim also, but also a form of practice a way of being, a way of being part of the world and share that being with others. Today, Studio Mumbai is constructing buildings around the world. You have done that in the Alps, in the Dolomites, you were mentioning, now in New York, in Wellensburg. Uh, and it's a way that 
it and but but keeps being something that is built on this uniqueness in this very unique way of working in this studio of two people this office of two people that that exchange with many others the list of works is endless we would need the entire time of the lecture to go through the names of the different projects that you've been working on and the furniture and the installations and many many things and so is the list of awards and recognitions that that you've received in 2009, the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture from the Cité de l'Architecture du Patrimoine. In 2009, also the Design for Asia Award from the Hong Kong Design Center. In 2009, you were finalist of the 11th cycle of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. Uh, in 2012, the Swiss Architectural Award. In 2012, the Spirit of Nature Wood Architecture Award in Finland. In 2014, you were the winner of the Grand Medal d'Or for the uh, from the Academy d'Architecture uh, in Paris, France. 2015, honorary doctorate from Hasselt University in Belgium. Uh, in 2017, Riva International Fellowship in London. In 2020, the Alvar Aalto Medal. 2021, the Dean's Medal at Washington University, St. Louis. And your work has been exhibited at the Canadian Center for Architecture, the Arc and Red at, at Bordeaux, the Danish Architecture Center in Copenhagen, the Victorian Albert Museum in London, the Melbourne, you did the Melbourne and Pavilion in 2016, uh, you participated in the Architecture Biennales in 2010 and 16, Chicago Architecture Biennale in 17, we could go on and on. And very recently, uh, uh, Bijoy opened the exhibition Breath of an Architect, which is still on view until uh, uh, April 21st uh, in Paris uh, with the Fondation Cartier. And we have here Dorothea Charles, uh, uh, part of the Fondation Cartier team, uh, the, 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 the kind of ambassador also here in New York, right? Uh, your furniture is uh, part of the collections of Pompidou, uh, SF MoMA, San Francisco, LACMA, MS, MSAS, Sydney, I mean, and many, many other places. This to say that this unique practice has been celebrated, it's been recognized, it's been also uh, mo moving people and, and understood by many and selves by many. Uh, we, 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 this format is a format that, that is uh, intended to be a conversation also. So your lecture will be followed by, uh, will, you will be joined then by Barjan Polman, director of uh, GISA Public Programs and Exhibitions and director of the, and curator of the Arthur Roche Gallery and by, Rat, uh, and by Ratchaporn uh, Chuchue, Chuchue, that is also GISA faculty and that will be in conversation with you. Uh, Ratchaporn is actually a design director of Alzone, a design practice in Bangkok, which has been commissioned to design the Melbourne Pavilion as well. Uh, in 2022, Ratchapon received uh, her VR in uh, Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok and also was graduated in the MSA AED program here at GISA um, and, and, and a PhD in architecture history from the University of Tokyo. So this promised to be a very intense and, and beautiful moment to connect with your work more intensively. And please join me in welcoming be joined here to GISA. Thank you. Andre, that was very generous of you. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here at the university, uh, a privilege to have the opportunity to share uh, this lecture. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Dan, uh, for making this possible. And it's a pleasure to be speaking to all of you here and for you to take the time. So I'm going to share very quickly, there are four projects quite different from each other. Uh, and it's more what I want to share with you is a sense of what we're doing at the studio. Architecture for me is actually a part of something much bigger, something much more complex. And so maybe what I want to share with you is this idea of something that I've come upon through my practice over the years uh, of questioning what I've been doing or questioning the ways of the things that I've been doing. And something that comes to me uh, more recently uh, is this sense of intuition in movement. This notion of intuition is really uh, a sort of uh, a honing device, something that we all have, and sort of drawing a sense of intimacy to that intuition in the process of when things are in a state of movement as opposed to a state of status quo. 
Civilization is built on an active footing, a world in constant flux, cultures continually in an ebb and flow. Air, water, light is our essential construct. Humankind and nature, nature and humankind is indivisible. So for me personally, air, water and light is really for me the building materials, not brick, not steel, not glass, not aluminium, but this is really the key component of what we do. So oftentimes in my studios back in Switzerland, I, 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 I talk about, you know, architecture is not about making buildings, it's about making space. When you think about it, that's what we do, we make space. And so this is what is the key components that allow us to make space, that allows us to breathe, that allows us to move, that allows us to uh, be intimate to an environment. As you can see, this is a hand-cut quarry. Uh, three materials, a crowbar, chisel, and hammer. It's been harvested over 500 years. The original Pallava dynasty was what emerged from this particular quarry. We were able to hone onto this quarry over a, over a period of a few years. Uh, but again, what I want to demonstrate is this idea of economy of means, like a, an ease of means of doing things. And so here to actually use gravity. Gravity is equanimous, available to all of us. It's applied universally across continents, and we all experience it in exactly the same way. So this notion of gravity as a material in the way to make things, to build things, uh, the force that attracts a body towards the center of the Earth or towards any other physical body having mass. So this is a project we're doing in Chennai. It's a house for a client, uh, but one that can be n number of things. It could be, uh, at a later point, an office, a studio, a gallery, or, or a museum. He's, he's an art collector. And so what I'm demonstrating here is that this is just using compression force, just the force of stones stacked one on top of the other. Uh, there's no shoring, there's no propping, and it also has to be conceived in a season, if you do this in the monsoons, it's very difficult to meet the water table. And you can see this is just the self-weight where you see this body of uh, stone immersing into the water. That's them excavating uh, the sand below. And I'll, I'll go into the next slide, which demonstrates how this is done. There's no mortar. Uh, there's no scaffolding, except for the sca scaffolding that is used to uh, build the stones. So here you can see uh, the key component is actually right there, this particular piece, which is what you see there. So one is to one drawing on the side, excavation made, goes around a meter. The stones begin to get stacked, as you can see, and they keep excavating from this portion here, right there. And they keep stacking, so they, as you excavate the sand here, this body of mass slowly using gravity just immerses itself into the ground. So it's a very simple device. This was a device. Again, there's no electricity, there's no mechanism, there's no machinery, right? This is, again, also this notion of, in this particular project, I made a sort of fictitious claim that we found something from an unknown time. An unknown doesn't necessarily mean past, uh, it could also be a potential future. So it sort of describes itself as an archaeology. It's more like an archaeological project. Uh, for me also what's interesting here is the methods 
the movement of the people, the gesture of the people, language, uh, communication, all of that is actually embedded. Uh, and we were talking a little earlier of how do we transmit things? I think the goal, or you know, when we make drawings, we make models, they're all means of transmission, right? That's their only purpose is to be able to transmit very different from an instruction. An instruction is very precise and can oftentimes be seen as absolute, right? So for me, this whole idea of making, of building, of, of collaboration is about this notion of how do we transmit. Uh, next slide. So this is a drawing, a one is, uh, it's a drawing, and I call it a one is to one drawing because it takes this portion here, this line that you see, is at the water table, that's where you meet clay. And where you see clay, you have water, right? So it's a very sort of integral part of where you would find water, you require clay, because that's what holds water. So that's a drawing of the well, um, can be seen as a, and I call it a one is to one drawing because it holds the DNA, the material DNA is embedded in the drawing, right? So it might, not necessarily be in the physical dimension, but it's, it's what's embodied in the drawing that is one is to one. Now we were talking about movement. Uh, so this is the construction site, and this is what it pretty much looks like every day, right? It's, that's, uh, so we made a claim that a well, a rock, and a tree was discovered in the excavation on this site. Completely fi fictitious, but somehow to ratify this claim, we had to find a method that would in some way embody this, this idea of, of a fictional claim of an archeology span of an unknown time. Uh, displacement, the action of moving something from its place or position. A displacement may be identified with the translation that maps the initial position to the final position. This is the same quarry. Uh, here you see an outline of this open space, the courtyard, which I'll show you in the next slide. So what's interesting is there's a cut and fill, right? There's architecture in two places, not just in one, uh, because as we, as, as we, so it's quite interesting, actually, and very quickly, they make these holes, they're about you know, six inches deep, and they can be defined by the thickness that you want of the slab, and so they drive those chisels in, and it's a tectonic plate that basically is released from the ground. Again, with stone, it's not on sight, but it's on sound. It's when you tap the, s the stone that they're able to understand what's beneath. It's the fissures they lay beneath. It's the water that travels beneath that creates this sort of gap in the stone. So you're real, this is really uh, a full-scale drawing. We were talking about a mock-up, but here's now, it kind of goes beyond the mock-up, right, where it is the action of something that is influenced here as also an influence in another location. So there are two projects actually being built at the same time. Cut and fill. That's the idea of a tree of you know an old 400 tree and this is something that we're going we have now finally you know over a period of time been able because trees are being cut for highways that are being built for for lands that are being divided you know there are trees that normally are planted on boundary lines and this happens across continents you know you you'll see you know way before they would plant trees or stack stones to define or delineate boundaries of inhabitation or ownership so oftentimes, you know, trees are being felled and we go in and we actually are able to uh, resuscitate the tree and that's, that's how this will enable this idea of a rock, a tree and a well. That's just a quick uh, photograph. Uh, this is how they used to split stone. You know, these, and I was, I'd taken this photograph just out of curiosity at, at a certain point, of course, way before this project. Uh, and these are uh, holes made to drive wooden wedges into these holes. And then water is poured on the wedges, and that's what expands and then splits the stone. Very simple device. Again, this whole idea of economy of means, like if you have very little, 
can I still make things? Can I still do things? So the tree still has to appear, but we also have a Friday, the dog, who's also a rescue, but he's very much part of the entire collaboration. And it's interesting, I mean, for me it's interesting that, again, the notion of building, it's not a construction site. It's a site that is inhabited every day. The plan, the section, the space, the scent, uh, the touch is inhabited every day. So you do it in repetition again and again and again and again till it becomes part of your being, right? And this part of your being is actually transmitted to the others that are part participant in the making of this project. So you can see, no, this is not taken for the photograph. Uh, there are several photographs that I have to actually go through. Uh, so in this particular site, there was, uh, you know, the first uh, scheme that was proposed by the engineers was to do these concrete pile foundations that were driven into the ground. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Shrija, 30 meters or something to that, close to that, more, she says. Uh, and so uh, they, we, he, we came up with this idea of uh, what is called a soil strengthening uh, exercise where because it's loamy, loose soil, sandy soil, uh, and that's why we had to drive these very deep pile foundations. And again, this whole idea of this notion of building, which is archaeological, so in some ways, every stone has been considered. Every, every, uh, it's also this other idea of what would the building be like, or what can a space be like if your eyelashes, you used your eyelashes to sweep every surface using your eyelashes. To think about it as an idea, you know, that is that a possibility and what could that present itself as? So this is soil strengthening, so you'll see it in the next one. This is the diagram of the soil strengthening holes were, small holes were bored into the ground and then we, December, we, we poured this lime slurry and then over a three month period, basically takes about three months for the, for, for the lime slurry to activate. And what that does basically starts strengthening the ground. It was after three months we could begin an excavation of the ground. Again, these projects are in a rhythm of time, right? I know that several questions will be asked much later, and I'm happy to respond to them, but this notion of being time-bound, I think it's only if you, if you allow time to bind you, I think that's another way to look at it, as opposed to use time as a way to to free you from it being bound in the same way that gravity can bind us, right? And here's an opportunity to use these as materials to actually provide a kind of freedom of expression, a freedom of making things. So this is a lime slurry foundation drawing. Uh, these are holes built into the ground. I'm just going to quickly go back. So it sort of strengthens all this earth and then we then make these excavations that are here. This here is to, these are holes that, that capture the rainwater to recharge the well. So you keep watering the plant in a way, you keep watering the belly button, the source, uh, which is the source for all life on this, on this site or this environment. So you can see now we've started the excavation and every stone, I mean, every stone is calibrated and there are these layers of stone. And I'm interested in foundations, uh, not because of just because oftentimes it's not what you see, right? It's not what you see that is possibly an expression of what you experience otherwise, right? It's what's below, right? It's not something that what's below the ground because that's what's holding you up much in the way that, you know, we're not, we're not designed to stand, right? This is not really the design. That's not how we're built. But there is something that enables us to be upright center of gravity, our spine. So it's this notion of the ground providing us kind of support, right, that allows for an expression above the ground, an inversion in a, in a sense. These are the plinth beam. This is a drawing of the plinth beam. I'm going to go fairly quickly, and you can see it's a paper joint. It's, it's cut, cut like wood. Now, for me, it's interesting because we can still do this. There are many things you can do in New York that we cannot do back, at, back in India, but there are many things we can do in India that necessarily cannot be done here. 
just because of the way things are and how evolution has made things move in particular ways. So it's joinery. And the plinth beam basically is taking care of damp rising that's coming from below the ground because it's a place that's tropical, it rains a lot. Uh, and what was interesting here was that there was a, there was a, a drought two years ago uh, and this site had actually had water because oftentimes when we reach out for water, we dig bore wells, that is tapping into the deep aquifer, your fixed deposit, so to speak as opposed to tapping into the water table. And of course, this then goes through a process of cleansing that by bringing it, or oxygenation, so you take this water, so while you see this well or the stone sinking down, there's water coming up. So there's an equal and opposite response to that action. This is the, the staff and our site office that we inhabited uh, while we were on the construction site. Very simple, it's a compressed, it's a, it's a, it's a space or a building in compression. Uh, it's a brick with lime mortar. Again, there's no concrete. It's not that one is averse to concrete, but it's interesting in this kind of construction the trajectory of this building is only moving upwards. As it ages, as it, as it ages over time, it strengthens and it only gets better over time. What happens with concrete, and not, you know, not to uh, give judgment over the material, of course we do use that material, but what it does is basically the day it's formed, it's going in the opposite direction. It's decreasing in strength in structure. Of course, that's now changing with you know, new kinds of methods, Pozzolano cement that we're developing, that's already uh, out there now, but that's really, uh, and so this is, these are all the sort of uh, kit of parts, if you want to call them. Door frames, uh, in this particular case, made with granite. Again, it's very common in this region to have these materials. And oftentimes, this particular stone and where it's quarried, they actually quarried for septic tanks and boundary walls. So again, there's an economy. You know, at, at a moment in time, they were built for civilizations, but not so much anymore. Again, these columns are in granite. I'm not nostalgic about the material. I'm not sentimental, but there's a sentiment. And there's a difference between sentiment and sentimentality. And what I want to share with you is this being true to this notion of this idea of making a claim that this was a site of an archaeology. And th these are fragments of that archaeology. So that's a cross section. Uh, that's the water. This water goes up to the roof terrace then comes down for the house, for the garden, and then whatever extras, it goes back and recharges. So it's this continuous sort of cycle or sick cycle that is continuously recharging, and this is really the source. This is the source of the source of the energy for this entire place. So it's a transact. It's a landscape that had got subdivided over time. And in some ways, it's a reconstruction of a sort of a subdivided landscape that could be spread over a distance of a few hundred kilometers. This slab on top here is a hollow core concrete slab that was developed especially for this project. And you can see that the, it spans over just very simply over the two walls. You know, you can see the brick walls. The spans are quite simple to, to span. Uh, so you can see the cantilever. So th this is about 22 feet long, if I'm correct. Uh, and again, the idea here was that without turning any electricity on, uh, the idea is to shunt the temperature. Do you, know, do you know the word shunt? It's to drop the temperature down by a good five degrees. So this notion that a building can look after itself even if we're, we have been gone, you know, uh, it can take care of itself, even if it's abandoned. And it's not so much in an abandoned that it becomes a living organism. It's a living physical entity that is living and breathing much like how we are. So it becomes really an extension of who we are.
This is that idea of the notion of what if the eyelashes were able to sweep the entire surface of the building. And again, it's not so much that, you know, can you do it in New York or not do it in New York or can I do it in France? Uh, the good thing is that it can be done where we are, so why not, right? And it, it, there's, a, there's an economy to it also. This is during the construction phase of the project. This is Diwali, which was a festival that we have. Uh, comes in October. So it's just, you know, you can see this idea of immersion, of inhabitation, and that we, we are occupying the space and we're living the space as it is right now. So complete in its incompleteness, incomplete in its completeness. So it's always in that inversion all the time. So this allows the space to be ventilated in, in, and it's tropical, it's quite hot in this region, it's very humid. So it allows the breeze, it allows the air to pass through continually. Yeah, we have these, uh, before I go back quickly, we have these ventilation systems that are passive, it, there's no mechanism to it. And again, it's based on the use of how you interact with the space, how you interact with the, with the building, much in the way that we wear our clothes. So the intention, and I think this is the next stage in May, in early May this year, we're going to actually do the planting. And then of course, through the process of time, the house will grow and it continue to grow and, and, and be an evolving sort of entity. This is a water tank. Uh, again, it's like a floating vessel very quickly. It's built with granite, notched in, so it's a floating foundation. It's like a boat in the sea, in, in the same way that it's a boat that floats in sand or in, on, in earth. Very easy, and so it's a knockdown water tank, or knockdown pool for that matter. And it's interesting because the cost to do this in what I'm calling the traditional way now, which is concrete and brick and all of that, it's exactly, or if anything, this is less expensive than doing it in that way. And there's a certain economy to it. So, you know, this whole thing of the notion of what is tradition and what is not. That's Friday again. You know, he's got the notes there. He's, you know, belting out the uh, work to be done. <laughs> That's the rock. Uh, again, this idea of a counterbalance, right? This idea of a weight, this compressive force in this space that pushes down to enable the water to rise up. This is building. This is a, the site every day. And so I'm, I'm interested in the idea of building as in the same way, in the way that we dance, in the same way that we move that it can have an elegance, it can have, can have the ability of grace built into that. So the transmission is how do you transmit this notion of grace, right? And that is then experienced back and forth. It's not just one way. So it's not about giving an instruction, but it's more about a process of giving and receiving that is really, that's what occurs on a building site. Affection, it is the ability, this is the next project, this is for a Japanese lady who spends a fair amount of time in India. She spends about seven months of the year. And she came to us and said, I'd like you to build my studio, my weaving complex, much in the way that I make my textile. And so we said, yes. Uh, affection, it's the ability to observe and to identify with another situation or condition and then to care for it and protect it and hope to provide it with what it needs to be itself. So this is a one-is-to-one mock-up or, 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 or an outline. 
right, of, of the, the space that has to be inhabited. The clients are part of this construction. They're, one of them is here, there's somebody there, and we're all sort of involved in outlining the physical dimension of what that space may be. And again, this whole idea of drawing you know, everyone into this construction. That's the diagram. It's basically the notion of the full moon that falls on the chest, that on the rising moon behind the hills. And that's the kind of diagram it basically draws. It, it, it's the idea of the diagram is based on capturing the moon that falls on your chest, the, the moonlight. So that's that sort of darkened pencil drawing in the middle. It's this little water tank which is used to now, you know, uh, make indigo because they grow indigo here. She, she basically makes everything. The thread, sericulture, grows the plants, grows the indigo, dye, makes the indigo. Uh, so it's, everything is done without leaving. So for food, clothing, and shelter, she doesn't need to leave her land. It's a complete total ecosystem where she can sustain herself. So again, this notion of sustainability for me is in what do we want to sustain? You know, how do we want to sustain? It's not about, you know, monitoring the electricity, the fuel that we have. It's all about being in, in a certain cadence to what's around us, a cadence to the environment that's around us. So here it's quite interesting that you can see the full moon rise twice. When you see it come off from behind the hill, and then when it's reflected back two minutes later, when it's reflected back into this little pool of water. So the question I ask is, is the light being transmitted from the sky to the ground? Or maybe it's from the ground to the sky, right? It's not necessarily one way. That what if this possibility of light being emitted from here? You know, the stars that we see up in the sky are a mirror reflection of us. Often to see ourselves, we require distance. If anything and everything was up close and this close, we would not be able to see ourselves, right? And so what if, and I'm asking this question, what if the star stars are a mirror reflection of what's out here, you know, around us? So this is the first day, you know, we've already started, they've already started plowing the field. What's interesting is the land was bought from the gentleman who's plowing the field with the bullocks. They were the same bullocks that looked after and cared for this land before it was bought by the person that now is going to occupy the lady here in, in the blue. Uh, and it was the same day that we started moving the rocks. It's, it's, it's very rudimentary. There are guys like throwing the rocks. There's always a better way to do that. But this was day one. Opposition to gravity, but not opposition in opposing, but opposition in movement, in, in synergy with this notion of gravity. So these are our drawings, these, you know, all these things we, that we do at the studio, and it's more like a construction at the studio. It's more used as a place to sort of construct an imaginary environment, and those are tools. These are just tools of communication, tools of transmission. Uh, so I look at these as notations, like a musician would look at a music sheet. It's notation diagram, right? If you put a, a, a written sheet music, when a musician reads it, there, there, there's a sense of sound, there's a sense of rhythm, right? It's the same thing that we do, drawings that we do in the studio, drawings that you guys do. For me, those are only notations, they're notation diagrams of a space, of a quality of a space, and that's what really is this whole endeavor in the studio to construct this environment which is spatial and, and, and experienced as a haptic resource. When I say haptic, means all our senses, including our intuitive resource. So what's interesting in all these projects, in most of these, and this one, it's all in a few square kilometers. Everything that you find, everything, including manpower, to a certain degree, is all found within a few square kilometer radius of the construction, or where this construction has to occur. Again, it's not so much to be in natural materials, but more that it's, it, allows for a certain freedom of movement, a freedom of manpower or human power, a freedom of availability of, you know, a resource of materials that are easily available. 
and also building methods that are already present in and around the site. So you continually have to adapt. You know, it's not something that's repetitive. Again, I come from a place of a billion, 400 million people, uh, and I would say very conservatively, we have at least 200 mi million bricklayers even now because most people know how to build their own homes because they're self-reliant. So there's a certain quality of a self-reliance that's built into this, into this notion of notation diagram and transmission. I'm not going to go through these plans. I, I mean, they're, they're, and so since it's, you know, all of you here, the architecture school can read it in seconds, I guess. These are just, you know, gestures. This is a gesture to the left, which is the breaking into the land. It's called, it's a, it's a ceremony that, uh, that uh, involves entering into the depth of the land, right? And uh, so uh, Bhumi means off place, off that location. But for me, what's interesting is we're now going to enter into displacing the status quo of a piece of earth that has been compressed over a millennia with rain, with gravity, so on and so forth. So it's an, a homage, like a homage given to the ground of entering it in the gentlest way as, as much as we can. And that's really paying that tribute to the land in receiving and giving again. So again, this gesture is very much an embodied aspect of the notion of building. Manner, from the French manière, substantivized use of the adjective meaning done with one's hands a notion which reveals a method of execution or way of doing, especially with regards to the outward manifestation of an embodied process. You know, I, I have a, my uh, friend and, and, and neighbor here, and she's a potter, a ceramicist. And it's that same notion of, you know, the, the, what you embody in, in raising clay up and, and then shaping it and giving it a volume. That there's a, there's, it's about intimacy, I think. That's the other word that I want to share with you is about how do we transmit this notion of intimacy between ourselves in the things that we do and the things that we make. So this is all practice. This is all the stuff that we made before we actually got to the site. So we fired bricks here. You can see there are little bricks and so on and so forth uh, because I had young students and interns at that time and no one, they, no one really knew how to build a brick wall. So we made little bricks, just in the same way that you make big bricks, we made little bricks. And then they had to make these walls with these little bricks so they could understand how bricks turned a corner, how they met a threshold, how they meet a door frame. So it's just like when we're kids, you know, you put the triangle in the, in the hole that has a triangle and so on and so forth. Simple building tools as mechanisms to enable all parties involved to participate with a certain integrity and intimacy. I show this slide because, again, for me, it's not about the architecture, it's not about the building, but if I ask the question that, what if four acres of land and surface was touched by the hand more than once? What would that be? What would that notion carry with itself? And so this is just an image of the intimacy of every aspect in the, in, the, in the notion of building, from the threshold to the door to the plaster. And you can see the proximity. You know, there's a certain proximity in the way that things are done. How am I doing on time? Faster? Okay. So again, this is a warp and weft. This is indigo that is grown. She, she harvests it, then she makes, uh, ferments it, makes the dyes. And this is a space. Thank you. So these blue rocks are actually used to sink the leaves into water, and so that's why these rocks come out blue. Uh, they're not, and, and I, I've, uh, I collect these rocks when I get the time uh, to go there, and if there are some still around. But there's something very interesting for me. Again, you can see every surface has been touched by the hand. And again, it's not the notion of the hand, but what it transmits, you know? like when we're caressed, when you caress a baby, or when, you, when you know, you're, you're caressed by your lover or your, your 
mother or your friend, you know, or you're touched in a certain way, it embodies a certain transmission. And that's really the same gesture that is being uh, given to this notion of making things. This is the room where they ferment the indigo. It has a skylight in there that draws the moonlight because it is known that when you dye indigo in the moonlight, it has a certain translucence to it. It's very different the day before or the day after. So there was a moment in February of 2018, full moon or a super moon, the sun and the earth were all in one line. This phenomenon happens every 144 years. It was two in the morning, she had this beautiful white silk that actually was originally from India, went, went to Japan, now not found in India, and she brings it back. And at two in the morning, we were there, we had the moonlight in there, and she dyed this thread. How do you give this thread a value now? You have to wait 144 years, right? Just that notion of, you know, the notion of value and time. Again, this whole building is constructed uh, outside of concrete or cement. There are lime, uh, slaking lime uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, setups not so far away. So we had a Swiss man who was here for two months, living on the site as a master lime maker. He's a, uh, it's, uh, he's a sort of specialist with lime who learned this method over 40 years, and he taught 30 young boys from the eastern part of the country who did not know how to build this way. And now that has proliferated and has grown. So again, it's not necessarily just about, you can develop a hardware and a software for a system. You know, no different from what you see in still, you know, the technological savvy San Francisco uh, boys and girls. We, can, we have the same capacity in what we do. It's, it's the same. So all this, what you see, the color, the cloth, the ground, the earth, all of that is part of the same space, of the same environment. It's all grown and is harvested from the same ground. Again, What's important, I'm very quickly, I know I'm going, I'm going a bit slow here, but very quickly, how do I go back? Sorry, no. Yeah, oops, sorry. It's to use gravity. We're up in the base of the Himalayan range. There's a water flow that, that comes from there, and how mm -hmm. this becomes an interface of drawing from that energy which is already present. It's already there to be harvested on and how much of it and how to do that in the gentlest way that one can. So this is a marble roof that you see above here. It's translucent. It's interesting because if I built this in plywood, it would cost the same. Uh, and that's just the way it is in, in my country, in India, that. The particular, this particular, and it's, you find it pretty much in the length and breadth of the country. They didn't go to the shop. Everything is harvested. All what you see here, whether it's a textile, it's all from, built, made from the land. That's the indigo. So once in a blue moon, you know, we've heard this saying, right? Once in a blue moon. And this is the same tank, sorry. This is the same tank where you see the full moon rise. So you also have this notion of once in a blue moon. Sericulture. All the instruments for weaving are made locally. So these intricate looms, which I still don't understand, this is a kind of complex mathematical algorithm that, uh, I mean, weaving is a very complex, but it's, it's interesting how the hands and the feet are used to make a textile. This is in the full moon, so this is without any uh, 
you know, light. This is actually in, in, in the night, these pictures. So that's why the shadow, this is the shadow of the moon cast at night. So all the illumination here is from the moon. So what if a building could emit its own light, right? This notion of building emitting its own light. And that goes back to that first video that I showed. And this cycle continues season after season, year after year. Terroir. Terroir is often understood to mean the soil and the microclimate that determine the qualities of wine. However, consideration can be given to human endeavor, socio-economical, cultural, political, as well as geological conditions as primary components of terroir. The soil bio biodiversity, micro and macro organisms, terrain, topography, climate, latitude, temperature, humidity, rainfall, sunshine, wind at all, influence the ecosystem and quality of terroir. So this is a winery that we're building in the south of France, very close to Avignon in the Provence, Côte d'Huron uh, region. This was a competition that we won. It was an open competition. And we presented this idea that we will build in the way that you make wine. Right, this notion of building much in the same way that wine is made, in that same gesture, in the same notion of making. This is a video, and it's like a cut and fill diagram, you know, a cut and fill. So 100% of the earth that has been displaced or excavated, all 100% of that has been, has been put back. So no truck came in with materials and no truck left. Right, it's, it's really, of course you have trucks here moving the earth and you have all of that, but here now you can see another kind of mechanism at play. It's not necessarily the hand. And again, what if these machines are an extension of the hand and, and are tree, and much, you know, and moved in, in the same ethos or in the same etiquette? So that's the cut been made, it goes down 12 meters down into the ground, all the earth is excavated from here, and the wine cellars, so this is an extension an existing winery that's been around for five generations, the same family that's held it uh, and you can see that, yeah, the, the transition that, that is taking place and I show this video because I think this is at the core of the project and the rest is very easy to understand of what is actually occurring on this, on this particular project. Okay. So 200 hectare Chateau Noftipap, it's the wine growing region of this particular red wine. And you can see how the, how the earth that is being displaced is now being sorted in different granular uh, capacities. So it is really, in a sense, sifting the soil like down to its micron and how the different uh, soil capacities, depending on the clay, the loamy soil, the sandy soil, the rocks, so on and so forth, and how they're then used to reconstruct. So all we're doing is basically reshaping the ground or reshaping the land by just in its displacement. So 100% came out, 100% goes back. But to give us volume of water, air, and light, you know, from opacity to transparency or translucency. So this is a site which is barely, a not even a kilometer away, and you can see there's maybe, and the, yeah, they will, we just passed it, and maybe we'll see it on the right, but it's not so far away, so you see the highway there, and the, and the site is on the other side, 
So this is a piece that they, my, the clients have, and so we were able to bring the soil here and sort it out in different batches, and then it goes back. That's what this photo was taken, I think, a couple of days ago, so I'm just sharing something. This is actually a work in progress. Uh, again, for this project, all the, all the mechanism to facilitate the making of this project all is in a 20-kilometer radius from the, ma the human power to the materials, so on and so forth, to the technology, so to speak, something that's been embedded over the years. So it's not so my, this notion of contemporary, okay, this idea of modernity and modernism, I, and I want to bring this, uh, you know, put this out, is that it's not so much in its shape, it's not so much in its character, but more in its integrity to how we make something. So it's quite interesting, the engineers, the clients, ourselves, all of us are making this for the first time. It's the first time we're doing it, and I was very nervous at the time. There's no machinery here. 87% of the machinery is taken out. No insulation, no plastics, uh, no foam, none of that. All the ducts are actually built in to the architecture. It's all in the same material. The hot mistral air of this region is drawn in. It's drawn in through these vents and goes down. And at the base of this is basically a water cistern. And that was the reason why we actually, so we're able to collect water because for one bottle of wine, they use two bottles of water. So from rain water to the water used for making the wine, so on and so forth. All that is basically collected and is the crucible on which, or the foundation that this entire project is built on. So this air is taken deep down and it's like a centrifuge and I will show you the plan. It's a kind of plan in a donut and this air then moves and then is dissipated to all the different spaces. So you can get heating and cooling and we have a very small mechanical room and that's basically a heat exchange unit where you basically transfer heat energy or cold energy by, by just changing that, that energy depending on the season. But we're able to maintain a steady 12 degree temperature without turning any switches on, no machinery. And it's interesting because one of the things that I, I was really nervous because you know you, we hear of wind tunnel tests and all of that and I, it's just, it's like kind of being a mole, like, you know, those guys who kind of dig in the ground and, you know, make these sort of intricate channels and networks and, you know, and then they, they're able to navigate through, through this sort of uh, subterrain, subterranean uh, landscape. It's much like that. This was a sort of conceptual diagram on the top, which was at the beginning and shows how by just excavating the earth and casting the slabs, we're actually able to get the space. And so from an opaque space, you then get a volume of space. But anyway, this was sort of in the beginning. And this is a drawing using the same earth. So the idea was to be in that discipline of making the drawing from the same and using a thread, you know, a line that we do because that's how we would draw. Today we use lasers, but you can draw this so I can make a room in five minutes, three or four of us, and we can make a one is to one drawing. So again, this idea of a one is to one drawing, but what is the meaning of one is to one? It's in the DNA, not necessarily in the physical structure. It can also be embedded in the notion of the integrity of the DNA. Angle of repose, the angle of maximum slope at which a heap of mass or any loose solid material will remain in place without sliding. State of rest. That it's, the, it's a position, right? You know, when we, we take a certain position and it's that point where center of gravity from your cranium is being transferred all the way down into the ground. And that's that moment when there's a sense of weightlessness or, or a sense of weight. And that's the notion of this transfer of center of gravity. So the foundations, the base, the water cistern is built in concrete. I think we were trying to do it in lime, but I think the clients were a bit nervous. So we said, okay, we, we allowed for that possibility rather than being so absolute that no, it can only be done this way. So the sort of subframe, the low bottom frame is built, uh, the water cistern is made with, from concrete. And it also holds water because that's what is a good material to keep water in or water ingress or, uh, or the same way going out. So that's the mud that you saw that was being sifted. It comes back in the trucks. It has this thing and it's being poured back. It's a little moist. It has a 10% cement, white cement 
uh, integrated into this part and then it's compressed. And it's interesting, no rebars. Everything above the ground, there's no rebars. And the walls aren't that thick. You'll see two or three stories high, and there's no rebars in the building. It's all on just gravitational force. The engineers were especially really, really very precise and really good at what they, what they did. So you can see that's the different kinds of soil that are separated, and then it's put back in, in, in a way. So... It mimics what was there in some way. This is the water system at the base of the, and it, where the water is collected. And you can see the layers of, so this is the base, that's the water system. And above that is the malaysium, the wine cellars. And then the next level, which is the working courtyard, which is that courtyard. This was the old existing winery, and then these are all the all the different new buildings that are added for all the different processes of winemaking. You can see the plant. So that's the water system. So it's based here. And then from here, it sort of travels. So I think there's an interesting notion. So the airspace now, let's say uh, 500 meters away from where we are, we're connected to the same airspace. They're 12 meters below the ground, and if it's raining up there, you can hear the water drops being collected in the water system in this. So it's very haptic. So for me, this project is more about the notion of sound again, this notion of the ear, more than the notion of the eyes. You know, uh, architecture in the way that we understand it is all about giving hierarchy to the eyes. But what if we were able to distribute this hierarchy in different ways? in the way that we navigate through spaces and the way that we make things between touch, sound, scent, and you know all the different uh, aspects of the senses. So that's just a very simple cross-section. And it's interesting because the airspace is connected. It's this idea of, the, uh, of something burrowing itself through the ground. And so that's really the, the mechanism in how this whole thing functions. This is a sort of central space, and you can see where the wine, when it's first made, comes and sits here for two years before it is then distributed into the different cellars. And this is, a, this is water that is in the slabs that run through the same water tank, and again, quite similar to that notion of water in the first project that I showed you, where it's in constant motion. So this idea of civilization is built on an aqueous footing. So these walls, there's no reinforcement. It's, it's a 50 cent. You can see the thickness, and there's no reinforcement. But it's very precise in the way that it's constructed. And the, the people that we are building, again, all from there, all south of France, French. Not so easy when you're dealing with a French person from the south of France. It's kind of completely different. <laughs> but interesting, I think, interesting. They're very, very just sort of emotional, and they're very much invested. What I want to share with you in this is that, for me, from the time we started the project, the project gets better every day. Every week, the drawing is better. Every passing week, and as we are now, we're about five months from, from handing over the project. So even yesterday or for the matter this morning, you can see that there's a shift. You know, it has just gotten better every day. Not because, you know, uh, not because necessarily of, for, for me. And so the way I want to say it is this hierarchy of a dance, like when we move in a circle, and how one person would go into the middle and then you come back out and then someone else takes over. So it's about kind of taking ownership of that space. And that's really this notion of how do you develop an algorithm that is a shared commonality. There's a construction of an algorithm, a mathematical formulae that allows for this endeavor to occur. And that's really what this notion of transmission and this idea of this circle of free jazz, right? You get six musicians to play and they sense a certain sense of rhythm. And it was wonderful because it was, I was, this was done in the lockdown, and I, they, I was, they didn't even know who I was, which is wonderful. It's like anonymity, which is fabulous. 
And it's interesting because I've been able to do this whole construction and follow it on my iPhone. No drawings printed, nothing, it's all on my iPhone. And I can say this because if you do this every day and you move through this every day, then you don't need drawings. You don't need, you know, I, 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 I know the space, I know the threshold, I know the door handle, I know the frequency of every micron of the place. But that frequency has to resonate within you. And I think, how do you cultivate that frequency to resonate within you? And in the same way, to be able to exchange and share with the people that are involved. So that, that frequency is then fed back. So it's about this notion of resonance and frequency. So this was the earth that we had, which had a clay uh, constituency to it, a component, and that's what we were able to do. And again, I'm, I'm not fussed that it all has to be the same. So there's a kind of freedom and a tolerance that you allow for things to enable themselves, to expose themselves as you, uh, in the process of making something. So you use time and, and energy as much as part of the whole process of making. These are just recent photographs. So I want to share something with you which is very important, for me at least. Uh, I had the clients visit me this early January. and uh, So it's, in, in my view, it's easy to make buildings. It's very easy to make buildings, you know, and we see that you know, across the landscape of the surface of this planet. I mean, there's building everywhere. But to make a building that can influence the quality of the wine, I think, that for me is my commitment, and that was my commitment to the clients. I'm not interested in the design of the building. I want to know after two years, because they'll be the only ones who will know that their wine has shifted. Something about it has shifted. So it's like holding a baby, right? It's cradled when you cradle it in, in a particular way. Uh, wine is bacteria, it's, it, it's alive, right? And, and the space that surrounds it, right? That's what is influencing that, that the air around it, right? And so the whole action of the whole purpose of going through this entire process is only one and the single that can this influence and affect and change the status quo of that wine that you know so well into something which is a discovery. And that's really, for me, the whole undertaking behind making this kind of building. This is the last project I want to show. Uh, it's a project in Onomichi in uh, southwest Japan, Inland Sea, Japan. Uh, this was something that I had to present to my clients because they wanted me to communicate my experience on the project. Uh, was done at the lockdown, if I'm correct. So my first encounter for Onomichi was in 2005 through the film Tokyo Stories, beautiful film by Ozu, I think one of the 10 best films ever made in my view. Uh, it left an indelible mark in me. And so when the clients came to me, the 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 function or the whole idea behind the project was to bring back the younger generation back to these smaller parts and towns of Japan, to bring back this, these people that had now migrated to the bigger cities like Tokyo and Osaka, and to bring them back to, back to their home. And so this film is about a family that that the, the children move to Tokyo and leave the parents behind. And the whole story, but it's a beautiful story. And it's interesting, that's really the site. That's the part of the site. Thank you. 
ろお弁当あおおけにオロメチウィズディミアズプレイスウェデノーションオフパレンフェスティスエクスペリエンスフォーム・シガノオヤ・セミナル・ブック・オダーク・ナイト・パッシング・ウィティン・イン・ザ・ナイトゥン・トゥンティーズ・ジョーニング・スタイン・デイ・トゥー・オズウズ・ナイトゥフィン・ナイトゥン・フィフティフィン・トゥー・キュー・ストーリー・ウィッチ・アジェス・ショリュー・スモール・クリップ・オフ・フレームド・ミッド・バック・ドロップ・オフ・オノミチ・トゥー・マイ・パーソナル・エクスペリエンスフォーム・マイ・ファーストヴィジット・ゥー・ファーストヴィジット・ゥー・ファーストヴィジット・ゥー・ファーストヴィジット・ゥー・フ So, it's an existing post war building built in the 1960s after World War II. This was where the Hiroshima bomb, it, so it was, this、uh, Onomichi is about an hour away, and the American prisoners of war lived, were, were stationed on the other side of, of this small channel, and this part was actually left behind. So, it's quite interesting when you go there, you see this entire culture from pre war to war to the Americans being there. And then all the different layers to manga, comics, and this whole sort of very complex layers of different times of Japan all interwoven into this particular town. So it's quite an interesting place for me. The nature of palim- palimpsest is twofold it preserves the distinctness of individual layers of time while exposing the contamination of one by the other. In other words, a palimpsest is a multi layered record. Palimpsest presents a utopian possibility of eternal preservation. That was Shiga Naoya's residence where he lived. He was this,、uh, this author, wrote this seminal book in Japan about this place, and he talks about the sounds. and、uh, It was a ship industry that was there, and so it's actually across this isle, it's this part where, you know, that he and the sounds that came up onto the hillside, so on and so forth. Very beautiful book. That he wrote and quite well known in Japan. To my surprise, I received a phone call from Japan inquiring about a possible collaboration for a project in Onomichi. And then the next week, Takeko san and a few of her colleagues were at my studio in the countryside during the time of the heavy monsoon. I told them, don't come. You know, I know several Japanese friends of mine who would be absolutely, you don't need to travel that far. Next thing I know, through the heaviest monsoon in the, in the it was like really the hardest. That week, and they showed up at my door. Anyway, they were my guests and stayed at my home. And in the ensuing days, many possibilities were exchanged for how Yamashiroya could be accommodated to host, draw, and receive the young generation of Japan back to places like Onomichi they had left behind, and for people traveling through lands near and far. My response to this premise was to imagine and create an interstitial space of the site, land, and building as an extension of the mountainous landscape. Where Long Log today is nestled in. So it's a kind of regeneration project、uh, in a way. It was a, it was a, it was a housing project. The, the client said、uh, he runs a shipping company, very old family of this region, and he wanted to give back something. He was in a Zen monastery for six years when he came back out. This is something that he's now actively doing as part of rebuilding this entire part of the inland sea.、Uh, of Southwest Japan. We spoke about a place, an open space that would be cared for in an intimate way every day, engaging all our senses in a manner that is becoming of nature in ourselves, ourselves in nature. That's the site. You can see that's the existing building. There used to be an old temple that was here on the site. And this was a sort of post war construction where they had these rooms. It was like a Uh, social housing、uh, project. So, again, this is a cut and fill in this. We gutted the, gutted the insides, kept the frame.、Uh, this was an old project that was there in the middle of the courtyard, and all the materials were ha- taken from here and actually used to make the floors and the rest of the, the sort of inside of the project. So that's the frame, and then I said to them that we need to start from here, and they nodded their heads. And in Japan, you would not get an answer in one day. They all will we'll come back to you. So it took a three months. And then I came back after three months, and they agreed okay, we're going to strip this whole thing and have it without anything in the project. And so the day they said that, I said, okay, now we can start filling it back in. So they said, okay, now we have to come back to you. <laughs> so this whole process went over a period of like three or four years. 
And then we were able to really tune the project into what it could hold and how it could be inhabited. So I saw this as an inverse of that film that I showed you, Tokyo Stories, because you see it on the other side of this project. That means if you look out this way, you see the landscape that is embedded in this film. And this is played here on, on, on the inside. So it also has kind of a shape of a Shakespearean theater, you know, this idea of uh, sort of, you know, the Globe Theater that you have in London. It has that sort of quality of this uh, sort of patio that lends itself to performances and all kinds of gatherings. And they do use this now in this particular way, quite. So this is the, it's called a doma floor and the, the house that was in the middle in the courtyard, the earth from that was taken with this, with a very particular and a special kind of earth that also has been fermented over a period of time. So the floors that were laid on the concrete Again, how do you make a space inert? How do you make a material inert? And that was a whole exercise of making something inert. These are drawings by that lady Takego-san, my client. So even the clients get involved in the drawing process. And it's quite nice because they already have an insight and you can actually draw from that. So in many ways, the work is being, everyone becomes a participant. Same thing with the winery, same thing with the project with the Japanese textile lady. So we actually gutted the building to make most of it a patio space, the whole, a large part of it. So I would say about a third of the building is an open space. So it's a community center on the ground and first level. And then there are these rooms above, which they run as like a, small nine-room hotel where you can go and stay. Uh, but effectively, it's a piazza or a courtyard uh, on the mountain. And surrounded by these beautiful old cherry blossom trees that have been around for, I don't know, hundreds of years, I think. So it's really inhabited and embraced by these cherry blossoms. The rooms are actually covered with paper. The floors, the ceiling, the walls, it's all covered in paper. This was developed by this gentleman here, Kitano-san, who has this particular way of making this washi paper, but it's got clay in it. And it's all made with this particular clay. So the light coming through is coming through paper and clay. Again, for me to learn the, the mathematics of the way that you know, the Japanese have their own mathematics of division of space and so on and so forth, like uh, one tatami mat. I intentionally sort of short-circuited that and I did a quarter ratio to that just because as a way to sort of uh, cheat it in a way that, you know, you're able to. And again, by covering the surface all in paper, it so somehow is like an erasing, you know, that Rauschenberg drawing of an eraser of a, of a diagram. That's really what... I attempted to do here in, in the making of this project. Again, here it's interesting because it was based on miscommunication, not communi but how it was communicated was misunderstood, right? So everything, there's an error, but an error is intentionally inserted in to provide for something that is of discovery for all participants involved. So I, you know, we've done this, uh, the surface of the building is covered in shikui, which uses the earth and lime. It's sprayed, that the first rain, and I got a phone call so saying that Bejoy san it's rained, and, and there's the plaster, there's a thing. But I, I didn't take the call that day, I said, wait for a week. Sure, if I get a call the next week again and say, Bejoy san what do we do? We've got the plaster and there are stains, there's like this thing, and you know, being Japanese is part of, very much part of their cultural heritage, like everything is precise and perfect. I said, oh, okay. Uh, it's okay, it's great that, you know, you can, the, the, the building will respond to the different, you know, east, west, north, south, ground and sky. So he goes, ah, oh, okay, okay. So if anyone asks us this, we'll say, we'll direct them to you. Bijoy-san has said that this is what is going to be and that's how 
they were able to free themselves of this, of this problem that they had, that there were stains on the building now. But it was intended, this patination was in intended in the whole project. It's wonderful because now people come here to get married. You know, there's this whole influx of young people. And, and I already saw it before. I said, I, I, listen, I already see this happening in Onamichi, so I don't know what you're talking about. It's quite easy. And it's quite wonderful to see this place now inhabited. There's a whole influx of the younger generation returning back. So this whole exercise is only done with one endeavor, the commitment to remain true to what really is the program. It's not the rooms, it's not the courtyard, it's not the plants, but this entire singular endeavor to draw that generation of people that have left and to somehow draw them back. And that is really the exercise. This whole exercise is to facilitate that. Log is a place responsive to change, absorbing the sun, the rain, the moon, and the embracing cherry blossom trees in the garden. That was in the Tokyo Story film. In the passing of time, we experience a perception of loss. In my view, nothing is lost. It is only obscured in time and our senses. In the resonance of our affection, we can sustain life in abundance, a gift we have all been given. To action, this spirit is wherein lies our choice. Ancient pond, a frog leaps into water sound. It's a haiku poem by Basho. Thank you. Joy, thank you so much for sharing all this incredible um, work, which is so intricate in many ways in terms of, and, and rich, I would say, in terms of materiality, ecology, temporality, labor, tools, you know, from, from the chisel to the iPhone, um, I, I would say. Um, uh, what Rajapur and, and I did, we, we had some conversations and we prepared a, a couple quick questions, which we'll ask um, right, right now, and then we'll open it up. Um, to, to you for questions as well. So, Rajapur, please. Thank you very much for Thank you. just a wonderful body of words, uh, very impressive. Um, I found that your words really uh, much about making. You talk a lot about how, it, uh, how you make all this uh, project. And um, as, far as, as I understood, you have a very um, special practice. You have um, a workshop and Craftman working closely in your studio and uh, which allow you to work um, also closely with, with the materials that inform the design of your project as well. Um, moreover, I assume from your lecture and our discussion before that you also have a team of uh, craft people working for you in some project. Um, which the craftsmanship is really stunning, I, I can say. Uh, they seem to be very important um, in the overall practice that you show us. But at the same time, I'm wondering, because um, in a place like South Asia or Southeast Asia, uh, craftsmanship is actually diminishing. Um, because of the hard work, because of the low wages, because of um, also especially in the construction sectors. Uh, the good one, usually they, they move abroad because they get more paid. Uh, we see a lot of uh, South Asians, uh, craftsmen working in uh, a place like um, the Middle East. I, I work with them quite some. Um, I'm just wondering how you managed to, to achieve such a um, group of uh, craft people. Um, do you train them? Are they working closely uh, within the studio? Um, how do you keep them? Do you really like pay them more than you should? That's why they work such an incredible uh, quality. Okay, so maybe I... So 
Firstly, for me, material is not external of us, right? That I am material, like you are material. Mm -hmm. We're all here material, right? And for me, that's really the central premise of what is the meaning of material, right? That it's only when we as a material interact with the material that the material will express itself. You know, I had a stonemason I worked with, he was 88. And he would often say that, you know, he, would, he taught me about how to look at stone or how to observe stones in a landscape. And he would often talk about, you know, the stone has something to offer itself. And you say, what do you have to offer of you to the stone? So it's not a one-way ticket, right? It's not a one-way street. Number two is, if they're going to Dubai or the Middle East, mm. pay them enough to bring them back. It's not so difficult. If you want something that is of value to what you would, the world that you would like to live in. So I think that's, uh, a premise that one has to consider. But that being said, I think it's not all about money at the end of the day, right? It's, it's about uh, what is exchanged in the heart too, right? So if you ask me, where does your mind reside? I would say here, not here, right? And it's about, again, making that contact, making that transmission, and, you know, like, for example, I had this Swiss uh, line specialist who's, you know, it's 1,000 Swiss francs for a day. He was on that site for two months with no pay at all. Right. I didn't even ask him to do it. I just said, we're doing this. And he says, I want to be there. He was there for two months. And he trained another 35, 40 people. And we still continue to build like that today. Right, so it's all about a question of what is it that we want to exchange and what is it that we want to share, right? And that becomes a sort of core. For example, the winery right now that we're building, it's being built, the whole project is about 70,000 square feet. It's 14 million. It's the same cost as building it in India, let's say. And this is the south of France. The, the people that were building it took a haircut because they wanted to be involved in the project, the contractors. Mm -hmm. They were doing it for the first time. The engineers were doing it for the first time. Everyone was in, involved in for the first time. So there's a learning curve in that. So they're saying, okay, as long as we break even, because now they can, they have a trajectory. Mm -hmm. So even the clients that we were talking about it when they were with me in January, and I said, they said, yeah, without a doubt, if we had to do this today, the project would be double. Today, right now, as we speak, it would be double at least. Right? So it's also putting building systems in that are not, I wouldn't say unknown, but are open for discovery, mm -hmm. right? So there's a curiosity, right? And for me, at the end of the day, I think for me, what we do, just in what medicine does, what doctors do, right? We work for healing. That's our work, making space. It's healing, right? So it's not just about economy alone. Right? It's not about just that aspect. And so if you, and it's important in some ways that if that is carried as the resource, you know, who doesn't want to heal? There's no one here in the room that doesn't want to heal. I have to think about it. Right? I mean, I can ask this question to anyone here, you know, in some way or the other. We all want to heal, right? Because erosion is a natural process. Erosion, mm -hmm. right? It's gravity-based. It's evolution-based. It's time-based. We are all in a process of some kind of erosion. Right? There's some amount of giving way. Mm -hmm. right? So that is very much an intricate process that has been built into the algorithm. And for me, that's why I am interested in doing what I do. If I had to make buildings and just make buildings, I have zero interest. So you are saying that it's, uh, it's more in the term of exchange. I have no interest in architecture. Mm. In that way, no. I have zero interest in that. Mm. But I have interest where architecture can provide something that goes beyond its physicality. I'm interested in that. And I'm interested in working with people that possibly can be drawn into that. And so... 
it doesn't matter where you are right it's it's limitless and it's outside of any boundaries of geography or economies or methods and sometimes you have to invent them so much like we're doing here in new york my 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 friends and clients are here it's the same thing you know no we don't need to build in cinder block and steel we can do it in another way if it means it's a little bit you know tricky at the beginning okay but it's in the insistence that we have to find another way because that's the way of longevity we're looking for longevity and my interest lies in longevity so you're you're from a family of doctors right is that correct yes. i remember from it yes. has but that has nothing to do with okay because yeah, because i wanted to <laughs> i don't want to make any sort of mm -hmm. connections no, here because my, I, my idea of being a medical practitioner is the healers mm -hmm. right you know, yeah it's all about healing yeah mm -hmm. any profession gardening there's that beautiful film with uh, peter sellers where yes. it, i think it's called friends if i'm correct it's a black and white from set here in new york mm -hmm. and you know uh, it's the same thing being a gardener where you spend your entire life to for a rose to blossom maybe 200 years later or maybe 100 years later much after you're gone but the scent of the rose can be experienced around the planet mm -hmm. it's possible but you have to allow yourself that possibility right it's only in that but if you doubt that or you're skeptical of that there's no way that possibility can exist my um my my question was not sorry my question was not not about that um my question was about um well i understand the monsoon um as in many ways um informing your practice but correct me if i'm wrong i mean from from the earlier locations of the workshop in the most more coastal um zones where the work itself from time to time had to be protected or even you mentioned um with the beautiful the, the sort of incredible well project that was affected by the monsoon as well uh, production you know temporarily stop stop having to stop um stop with work uh, because of the monsoon uh, but also in terms of of materiality and i read in some earlier interviews your study of certain technologies that were meant to protect crops from the monsoon um uh, etc so there's this sort of let's say historical understanding in your work of the monsoon as, as shaping technology um and but at the same time um right now as as the the, the sort of climate crisis i'd say teaches us that the monsoon itself is now also shaped by by our technologies and i wonder sort of given that your work is often um explained as a sort of um brilliant combination between tradition and, and modernity um in a way I, i wonder how your work is is affected um by climate change and then of course specifically the, the 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 monsoon and the sort of unpredictability of it that is that seems to be increasingly unpredictable the the strength that is increasingly increasingly unpredictable the seasons that are changing and it's becoming a sort of deadly deadly force um so i I'm, 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 this is not a question about sustainability because i understand your your point about sustainability mm -hmm. very well I, i would like to think so so this is really not not about that i'm just curious how is uh, your work you know the wine the wine how, crops might yeah. move yeah exactly i mean how do you how do you make something that can sustain unpredictability right that's built into a system that is now whatever it is man made so on and so forth a while there is a crisis one has to be resilient internally mm -hmm. because if the external crisis becomes a crisis that is internalized then there's a crisis internally i'm not in a crisis internally first mm -hmm. right because i have to continue to do what i have to do irrespective of those fluctuations mm -hmm. what i have to be observant of and what i have to be uh in view of is being in rhythm or developing rhythms that can make those fluctuations make those unpredictabilities very much a part of of actually turning a crisis into a possibility mm -hmm. right and so i'm interested in that because there will always be a crisis mm -hmm. when has there not been a crisis right. right that's just part of our humanity part of that's why i express this notion of what gravity does right but to send a rocket into space you require gravity mm -hmm. right it's you need an oppositional 
You need something to have a trajectory, like an opposing ground to have that. So for me, it's not I, while, yes, there are moments where, you know, uh, war and all of these things that surround us, right? All of that. I think one has to be in tune with what's around us and, and be to know that it could be possibly you. And so to be immersive in the way that how do you participate where you are, are the gardener, right? Every day, every day, watering the plant. Mm -hmm. And in that, maybe there's a possibility because that's the only thing we can really do. So to work from that possibility as opposed to one that, you know, there is no hope. Mm -hmm. So if I'm able to respond to your question, and that's what I mean that this is not a situation that, oh, I have, to, and I'm not saying, and there's a little bit of wit in what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Of course I care. Of course I care about, you know, and when we say sustain, sustain what? Longevity. How do we bring longevity? Mm -hmm. And one way to bring longevity is to be one of those participants where you can possibly slow time down. With the question of temporality, I think I find it fascinating right, it's, in your work. Um, it's, in that it's this notion of, so if we all danced in that way, right, um, to slow time down, maybe there's a possibility in that. Like yeah. the Aborigines, for example, mm -hmm. before going to sleep, <coughs> they, so lore says, I mean, it's in their, in their writings or in their, ways of inhabiting, they drive a stake into the ground. Why? To slow the rotational axis of the earth mm. while they're asleep. Because their entire civilization, their entire notion of time is actually based in the time when they're asleep, which they talk about as dream time. So what occurs in that, that period of time is what is then expressed when they're awake. So it's this, the time that they're asleep is more important than the time when they're awake. And so this gesture of driving the stake is to slow time down and to protect that. Right. So, thank you. Oh. Um, maybe this is a good moment to to open it up to questions. Right here. Yeah. And there's microphones coming. Arisa? Oh. Here, in the front. Um, hi, I'm Raj. I'm from Mumbai as well. Um, I just had a question. Um, hmm. Have you ever had to explain yourself uh, when you were starting um, this, in this field? Like, I, I personally experienced that I have to sort of explain myself. That I want to, like, you know, to, let's say, the community around me that what I'm doing is um, valuable. Um, for example, like when I see your work, it has, you're, you're touching this uh, complete different realm. Like for example, the story you said, you know, uh, about let's say the cosmos and time. And, uh, and there's something where you have like sort of escaped um, the need for, let's say the structural like daring, that you're, like, you know, where architects usually uh, tend to like cantilever too much or like do these crazy things to sort of like legitimize that, oh, I, what I'm doing is of value and this is sort of stunning because of how much it cantilevers or how grand this is or how expensive this is. And I feel like you sort of like, I want to say found a way to escape that where your projects, um, even in the simplicity, like, uh, like that drawing there, like the ripples in the pond, the projects feel like that. They're sort of, these very subtle things that are equally powerful as as powerful as let's say uh, cantilevers in um, Nehemiah's projects or like you know there's the equivalent the equivalency is there. I just want to know how is it possible to to sort of you know um, maybe I can see that you trust yourself. I just want to know how do you, how can you tell others to trust themselves where you don't how have can to I tell how can I tell what how can you teach others like how can you uh, Tell us that, you know, what you're doing, you know, how can one trust themselves where they don't have to explain in, when they're starting out their career that what I'm doing is valuable? I don't have a career. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> in your practice? Yeah. So you answer the question. Be in practice every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. You don't need to explain. It's there. It's the evidence is there by you being in it every day, every day. I mean, it's not a career. There's no success. It's not about success. So I think once you, that's if you want it that way, right? Uh, and I, th yeah, it's just you know, at at there's a moment in time when. And that's why I said intuition and movement was how I started the lecture. Was when do you begin to trust that notion about you? Right? And it's it's honing into that every day, every day, every day practice. Of course, I mean, part of what you do, it's not about explaining, it's about how to make inclusive what's around you, then you don't need an explanation. Because what makes you think that what you do is of value and what others do is not of value? Why is your value more than someone else's value? Right? And so I think these are things that you have to figure out for your own self. I can't teach this to anyone. I think we have another question right there. Hi, Vijay. Thanks for the wonderful lecture. Um, at some point in your presentation, while looking at the um, buildings or the environments that you've created, it almost felt like these buildings start inhabiting themselves, especially the temperature drop and the bacteria that you were talking about in the wine cellars. So is there an instance in your practice, I'm just curious about this, um, when the buildings, they're almost like beings to me, and uh, do they have a sense of uh, intuition that you feel or you tune into when you, you as a maker, when you start inhabiting them, do you also sense um, their sensorial uh, spirit or their sixth sense and so on and so forth? I, or their unknown time? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. So I said something in, in, in when I was speaking was there's this notion of giving and receiving and receiving and giving. Think about it. Most often, if, if someone has to give something to you, you're already skeptical about that, right? And, and I'm just saying that, or how am I going to be generous to give this back? That's the first thing that we, or it's too much, right? I think it's, what we're talking about here is a mutual generosity and that exchange, because in that, this discovery for, for me to experience this physical entity as a being that you, you talk about. Because I learn through that and make discoveries about myself. Because I'm as much part of that, what has been there, as that is part of me. Right? So it's, it's equanimous inversely. And I think that's what we're, at least I am looking for, is a certain sense of an equanimity that is exchanged. And in that, there is this whole notion of discovery, like how little one actually knows. You can start singing in that. Other way to map them. <laughs> Any other questions? Please, there. Uh, from your projects that you presented, you worked with local artisans. Did two two questions? Did you seek them out, or did they find you? And then, the local artisans always seem to be consistent with the local project. Is there? Do you have any interest in transferring? A uh, local artisan from one geography to another to create tension. To create tension? Yeah. 
What do you mean by create tension? Uh, an Indian artisan in the south of France. Sometimes it's not necessary to have that. Like I was mentioning that we had the Swiss master lime maker in India, right? Then the this kind of goes back and forth. It's not necessarily one way. Uh, but what I, more importantly, what I want to say is the transmission of an etiquette. That's more my interest, more than, you know, it's an etiquette of the way you move, the etiquette in the way that you make something, like someone who makes food, right? I mean, and actually I can tell you quite an interesting story. And it's, a, you know, so I'm doing a project. I didn't show it and maybe uh, because it's still quite nascent, but we're doing something in the southern, like the last island of Greece, which is about a kilometer from Turkey. Uh, it's a place called Castellorizo. And there we're, we're building. So I had my friend who I'm building this house for. There are a couple of other things that we're building. And we are building this much in the way that they built five, the time that these buildings were made because you have to maintain the form, the window, so and so. So it's in a sense a pastiche, right? And the only way for me to free myself from that pastiche is to go back all the way to that distance and bring it back now. Because now it's present. It's not something of the past anymore. And it has the same rigor. And in fact, our endeavor is to take it further than the way that they built it then, right? Uh, so anyway, so the main contractor is from the island. He's Greek. And he would ask me the question of how do you find these people? Mm. And he takes great pride in, because he wants to demonstrate what he can really do as a way like it's, he's from the place. Anyway, cut a long story short. So I was there a few months ago. I got there and there were these two guys kind of much like me, my skin color and all of that. And so I, you know, I, you know, they introduced themselves. I'm, I'm Johnny and I'm Sula and I'm uh, Sulis. And I said, you don't look like a Johnny and you're not a Johnny and you're not a Sulis. And uh, then I spoke to them in Hindi, right? Because I could tell one of them was, I don't, didn't quite know. So he said, oh, I'm from Afghanistan, but he spoke fluent Hindi, but closer to the border of mm -hmm. Pakistan. And there was another, and his friend, his mate was Pakistani. And, and, uh, and so I said, okay, now come out with your real name. So he said, I'm Afzul. And uh, the other one said, Asfahin, they're like these two names. And then we started speaking in Hindi. Now, three or four days before that, my Greek friend, you know, Greek Cypriot friend was in India. And we were at one of my sites and I was speaking in Hindi and we were going through things and, you know, all of that. And the next thing we know now, we're in, in Castel Lorizo. And I start talking to the Hindi. The next thing we start talking and we start speaking about what has to be done, da, 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 all of that. So they become the translator to the main guy, Clemis, the contractor, right? Uh, who, who actually is the guy who is running the project. And he's kind of standing there looking very curiously, like, what am I saying to him? And this is transferring to, to him the other way. So, and there is Mike, a friend of mine, like just started, we were, you know, he was cracking up because, so for me, it's interesting, this idea of cross-pollination, right? I don't look at it as craftsmanship. It's more about stories that we carry within ourselves, you know, when we travel. If you go to Machu Picchu or if you go to some other place that is not necessarily where you are from, you carry stories about your place within you. And how those stories get assimilated, that moment, that notion of palimpsest. No, these are stories that are exchanged. And it's in that stories that cross-pollination occurs. So that there's a vibrancy, there's a richness. You know, we in, in my school when I was teaching this whole migration phenomena that is taking place from Africa and of course even the United States. There's opportunity here. There's opportunity of, of new language, of new possibilities, new discoveries to be made. Because not everyone is coming with that idea of consumption, of taking away, of denuding a landscape. If anything, they want to make that landscape richer because where they're moving away from is exactly the opposite of what they are seeking, right? So... That is the craft of the exchange of the stories of the cross-pollination that is there because you can invent anything from that. You know, it's not about a traditional method or it's not about a new method. It's about 
the invention of a method and in the possibility of that. For me, I'm interested in that exchange. It's absolutely wonderful to have this exchange because now, and it was really interesting in that moment where you know we had to laugh and they were in, it's the hierarchy of structure of who's the boss, who's the client, who's the blah, the architect, whatever, blah, blah, blah. All that gets dip, dissipated into sort of a singular entity moving towards the same idea. That's what you want to do. That's what that's the algorithm you want to write, is to move in a kind of seamless way towards an idea. If I'm able to answer your question. Right. Thank you. I think there was one more question there. Are there any other questions? Because in the interest of time, I propose combining them. I see Val has a question. So first you, then Val, and then two questions here. Am I missing anyone? So we're going to combine four questions. Sure. So <laughs> Please. Hi, my name is Monavi. Um, I'm not an architecture student. I stumbled into this accidentally, so I, I really do apologize if this question is bad. Um, I, I grew up in New York for most of my life. I grew up between New York and St. Petersburg, Russia. And my, my qualm with architecture was always that it made me depressed because it felt so strange from nature. It felt so cold. But, but something about the way that you've used um, the materials of the land that you're working in, everything is so contained in terms of where you're, you're sourcing, what the homes and, and the structures are made of. There, there's a life to it, and I, I, have, I wonder, is, are there ever times that you look at what you're creating and wonder if it's, it's too cold or too unnatural, given that you want to create something that breathes and lives within the space as its own organism? Uh, well, next one. Thank you again for the lecture. Um, you changed the name of your office from your name to Studio Mumbai, and you've spoken about how you treat your projects in terms of longevity and bringing in and how the buildings can change over time, how the spaces can evolve. Um, I'm curious, what do you see as the next generation for uh, your work, and particularly at the level of the organization of your office? Okay, and then two questions here. <laughs> okay. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. My question is, uh, so you speak of these notions of care and reciprocity and uh, giving back and respecting uh, resources like land, air, water. I think what I'm curious to know is how does this transfer to uh, the labor? For instance, I think through your presentation, it's extremely prominent that the labor is a huge part of the construction process. And in a country like India, having previously worked there, labor is extremely exploited, overworked, and underpaid. So how do you, just to ensure that your practice is a thorough practice? Labor, labor exploited and underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. To answer your question. Okay. <laughs> just so you should know that. No, so yeah, just so that to ensure that it's a thorough practice in terms of <laughs> concepts of care and everything. Oh, how does that? And then the last question. What if I said I do many projects for free? How would that answer? How would you answer that project now? Your question. I'm saying labor underpaid, not paid. Now work. No, it was, I just want to know your thoughts. No, it's an important because this that's your understanding of exploitation. Right? Are you willing to do that? Because then that notion of exploitation can be something completely different. That's just the lens in which you want to see something. That's a prejudice that you carry. That I will only work if I get paid. I said to you in this lecture, there was a Swiss man who worked there for two months without pay. He came on his own. Nobody asked him. Nobody said he should do that. Is that an exploitation? Right? I work for free on many projects. Is that an exploitation? I'm happy to work on that. Let's move to the last question. Here. Hi, Bijoy. Um, thanks for a great lecture and showing all your projects so in-depth. Um, 
my question was, you work really closely to material and how humans as a material interact and uh, kind of produce a result in a way. You work really closely with these craftsmen, but um, did you ever find that um, you personally wanted to work with these materials yourselves? Work with, you personally wanted to work with these materials yourself, like you wanted to work the stone yourself, or you wanted to ram that earth yourself to come to a better understanding of the material? Or did you feel like as an architect, how did you negotiate that agency of deter determining that material form with the with the craftsmen themselves? So I'm going to go this way. Yeah, okay. whatever, whatever order. Basically, the respond. question very quickly. You're, okay. You remember all of them, or yeah. I should? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay, let's go. So around. Yeah. Is that I when I said that I'm immersed, I live that. I am ramming the earth. I don't have to physically ram the earth. It's physical within me. I'm lifting that earth. So I'm experiencing that. I don't need to see a drawing. I don't need to see, you know, I said I can do it on my iPhone because I live it every day, right? So this notion of it being external to you and I've been, I've, I've been trained as a carpenter for five years. I have worked here in America making huge models for the Getty Center, models that could cover the size of this room for a whole year, right? So it's not about because I'm a carpenter, I cannot do this or if I'm this, I cannot do this, right? That's the beautiful part about Technology transfer, we're technology. And we can transfer this into whatever mediums we have to. But again, it's not about, it's about being the earth, not being, not the earth being rammed, right? It's about being the earth and what it has to offer. Like I said earlier, the stone has something to offer of itself. What do you have to offer of yourself to the stone? It's in that same dynamic, it's in that same dialogue. So everything then is up and available to participate with. It's just how you want to participate with that. How much do you want to invest yourself into that? I said I'm not interested in architecture, so I don't have to be an architect because I'm not interested in architecture in the way that we talk about the notion of what architects are. I don't want to be that kind of architect. I have no interest in that. Right? So I don't know if I've answered your question. Going to the St. Petersburg and of course, I mean, there are moments that you're concerned about, not so much about buildings being cold, it's a way that you work, that you use your body and your sense as a way to measure, because we have been given the body, because that's the way to measure, right? And how true or how tuned you can be to that measure, right? For a potter, too much force, would break that too little would not allow that right so it's all about the movement of measure right and that's where the calibration of how you want to shape something or how you want to make it be right so and that's the potential of everything not just in building and uh, one well, yeah the last question like, about what the next generation uh, if if in there is, I should that uh, of your office, yeah. My like. office is not an office, number one, right? It's not an office. It's a, it's more a studio. It's a place where I practice. And this is something I wanted to share was that when we were at the studio upstairs, right? So when I was at when I was in school in at WashU in St. Louis, and for me the studio environment was the best place. Like it was, I could be there all day, and I was saying that I was there. And the only commitment I made was I want to continue this practice outside of school. Mm. And this is the only thing that I want to retain is to maintain a studio practice much in the way that you do it upstairs. So that's the only thing. How that evolves, how that shapes, how that moves, that's all based on ecology, evolution, you know, climate crisis, all these things that we're talking about, right? But it remains as a studio practice, and that's all it really is. Nothing else, right? Things will come and go. This is version 4.2, and we're not that big a studio. There's Srija, who's here, you know, who's the boss of the studio, actually. She runs the studio. Uh, and there are a few people that we work with, you know, who make things. Uh, and then the whole world is there to be part of your studio. 
or you be part of that studio it's it's a completely open field right it's it's all doable even here in new york on that note please join me thank you thank you thank you very much